You're tuned in to the only all sports talk network in the Middle East, IsraelSportsRadio.com. You're tuned in to the only all sports talk network in the Middle East, IsraelSportsRadio.com. Building love of Israel, one sports fan at a time. IsraelSportsRadio.com Building love of Israel, one sports fan at a time. IsraelSportsRadio.com And as always, you can chime in, send me a text or a tweet, tweet at me at the SCG or send me a Facebook message, facebook.com forward slash sports talk. Or you can call into the studio, get in on the line, get me your opinion voice to voice. 856-330-4749. Looks like we have a caller right now. Caller, you're on the air. Hey, Rabbi, how you doing? Very good caller. Where are you, where are you calling from? Mo from Brooklyn. What's going on? Mo from Brooklyn. It's been a while. It's been a long time since you've been on the show. Glad to have you back. How you doing out there? Good, good. Keeping it, uh, keeping it sane here in Brooklyn. All right. I hear that. So uh, what's on your mind? Uh, what's up with the NHL? All right. All right. Some NHL. It's, uh, it is the NHL offseason right now. We do have some noises, some rumors going on with regards to the NHL. What's on your mind? Uh, I want to talk about the realignment. Uh, I think that the new realignment is going to help in terms of uh, rivalries. But uh, if you notice that in the Western Conference, in both divisions, a good point that you bring up with regards to the realignment that there is of course a disparity of teams depending on which conference you're in eastern or western but of course it also I mean, the reason why they did realign it was because it would provide for better rivalries and it would also allow for fans in columbus not having to stay up till 10 o'clock at night in order to watch their columbus blue jackets play so it certainly helps with growing the fan base with this new realignment and also helps with the actual fan rivalries and the team rivalries city to city it doesn't help so much with the travel miles because a lot of teams are still doing a lot of miles nonetheless but in, with, with regards to the rumors that have been swirling over the last couple of days or so that gary batman has been trying to, uh, you know, to, to really petition the Board of Governors, the NHL Board of Governors, to consider a new team. They don't really look at it as a Seattle, per se, as the being the destination city. They look at a new team in the Pacific Northwest region of the United States. They're looking at, or rather North America, they're looking at it as Seattle, Portland, Oregon, somewhere in those lines, somewhere in that sort of uh, uh, region of the United States. So when they talk about Seattle and Portland, the questions, of course, that uh, that come up, and, and we will, uh, you know, we're going to have a little later on the show, uh, our, our hockey insider, uh, our WFN NHL insider, Dan Freeman, is going to, you know, we'll, we'll certainly ask him about this. What you have to do, what you have to understand is that in order to have a team, a new team, there has to be fees, expansion fees, I think they're now about 250 or $275 million. There has to be an arena that the NHL deems suitable to play in. Right now in Seattle, the only thing that they have is the Key Arena where the Supersonics used to play before they went to, uh, to Oklahoma City and became the Thunder, that being in the, in the NBA. The thing though, with Key Arena, at best, it's a place that is abandoned, at best. You can play there for a year or two, but then you have to have a new arena. So the question here is, for a possible ownership group, is that they would have to build a new arena in the sense of, if you build it, they will come. And then hope that the NHL will give them a team. The other option, of course, is in Portland, where the Portland Winterhawks of the AHL of American Hockey League have been very, very successful in drawing a fan base and drawing a crowd night in, night out, game in, game out. The question, though, will be, they do play in a very state of, in a really nice state-of-the-art state arena, but the question in Portland is, can the city handle two very... You know, one is a really good team, the Portland Winterhawks. The other one would be something of a new uh, idea, something new that the city has not had before. And, of course, the people will go to watch them, that being a possible NHL franchise. That being the case, will the, town, will the city be able to handle two professional franchises playing the same sport? That, of course, remains to be seen. So these are among the uh, many, many questions. And, uh, and, Mo, we appreciate your phone call here on Sports Up the Sports Rabbi. These are some of the, some of the you know, good questions, the big questions that they have here um, for a possible new franchise. Um, in terms of, that was Mo from Brooklyn, of course. In terms of what the NHL can do to ready themselves for a new arena, there, of course, are going to be more talks, more, uh, you know, petitions, more studies done before they make such a, a commitment to putting in a new team in a, a relatively new region for hockey in terms of, or for the specific terms of also kind of evening out the, uh, the, the conferences after what the realignment has done to them. Of course, you want to get in on the phone call, get in on the conversation, 856-330-4749, or of course, uh, you can chime in, hit me up on Twitter, at uh, the YCG is my Twitter handle, or you can send me a message on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash sports talk with the sports rabbi. Uh, in terms of what has been going on, though, with the Biogenesis Clinic? And, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we, we've been talking about this. Everybody's been hearing about this uh, Biogenesis Clinic thing, the whole, all the, the, the steroids, the scandals, and things like that. Of course, the big question is going to be how baseball moves forward after this, how baseball um, moves forward from the possible, uh, you know, fallout from such a, a uh, you know, a scandal, really, to hit the sport. And when you look at what baseball has been, what baseball has done over the last couple of years, they have tried to go back on where they used to be, and that was, let's all take steroids. Let's all do it to promote the game, to get everybody interested, everybody involved. And they've done a real 180 now saying, no, you can't take it, you can't juice, you have to make the sport clean. And of course, it's kudos to them, but there are a lot of people out there who feel as if Major League Baseball has become a two-faced organization. On the one hand, saying, yeah, let's do it. And then a couple years later saying, no way, no how, not a chance that we're going, going to, uh, not a chance that we're going to go ahead with it and allow for the game to have steroids in it. But of course, we'll deal with all that when we have our, uh, our, our voice of the Drexel Dragons call. And a little later on, our blue sign is also a Philadelphia native, Philadelphia insider, give us everything that we need to know about baseball. Right now, though, if you want to get on the conversation, 856-330-4749. Looks like we have a caller. Right now, call, you're on the air. Hi, it's Yogi from Brooklyn. Yogi from Brooklyn. How you doing out there? How's Brooklyn today? I guess we're getting a lot of love from Brooklyn today. How you doing out there? 
baseball. What's going to happen? Well, how is the summer going to end? And of course, a little later on the show, we'll try to squeeze in some football talk and what training camp and things like that, uh, different things that we've been hearing uh, throughout the NFL world. And of course, taking your phone calls. You want to get in on the conversation? 856-330-4749. Or you can text, you can chime in, you can send me a Twitter message, you might tweet at me at VLCG or send me a message at facebook.com forward slash sports talk with the sports rabbi. Uh, what we've been hearing. Well, of course, over the last couple weeks, and, and likely this is going to end up blowing up and, and uh, everybody's face in a sense, is that the whole biogenesis, the biogenesis clinic, the scandal, the penny suspensions and all that, what it means for baseball, we will likely find out tomorrow um, as the league really wants to let everything just kind of settle after all of this, um, after all of this, uh, you know, everything that's been going on the last couple of days in terms of baseball and the trades and whatnot. But right now, joining us on air is Ari Bluestein, the voice of the Drexel Dragons basketball and, of course, the CEO of SFBN Philly High School Sports Network. Ari, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Yes, very good. Very good. So... Right now, things kind of have to settle a little bit in terms of the trades, in terms of everything that happened by the deadline. But what I want to talk about is the Biogenesis Clinic, uh, the petting suspensions that likely are going to take place tomorrow on Friday. Uh, what does this mean? What does, no matter what it is, right now we're hearing that it's likely going to look that all the players who are, who are going to be suspended came to the MLB, came to the commissioner's office and said, OK, we're going to take a 50-game suspens suspension, except for Alex Rodriguez, or so it seems he at least is the largest, the biggest man out there who is going to fight tooth and limb. What does this mean for baseball going forward that Alex Rodriguez, so to speak, the biggest fish out there, is not being reeled in so easily? and what they're doing now. There have been a lot of people who, and myself included, who are kind of calling out baseball as, as, as a league, as, a, as an ownership, saying that they're a little bit two-faced because they, on the one hand, benefited during the 90s and early 2000s from players using steroids, almost in a sense that they're encouraging them to use the steroids. Uh, like we just saw in 1998 with the home run chase, the chase for Roger Maris' record 61 home run. Like, I remember it. It was everybody and their grandmother was watching TV, was watching baseball in the, in the dog days of summer to see what Mark McGuire was doing, what Sammy Sosa was doing, and uh, up to a point, Ken Griffey Jr. as well. And now they seem to be turning the tables on, on the players. How, how do you look at this in terms of uh, baseball being called out from time to time, or by some people, rather, in the media, as being two-faced? Genesis, we can really pick it apart piece by piece, but I know that your, your time is short, and you, you're, you're a busy guy, so I'll leave you with one last question, and that is, you're a Philly guy, and Phillies have a lot of question marks all throughout the season, buyers, sellers, and of course, the dust is settling, but the same goes for me, I'm a New York guy, I root for the Yankees as a kid growing up, where do you see both the Phillies and the Yankees finishing this season? what both the 
Phillies have gone through in terms of this season to, to right now. Right? You, you, they they kind of give you that glimmer of hope if you're the Phillies fan, you're rooting for them. They give you that glimmer of hope, and then they go on like a, a, a two week road trip that they end up going, you know, two and ten. And that's really what happened with the Phillies right now, right before the deadline. They just had that big road trip that they only won uh, like one game. So what the Phillies really did, them, they did themselves in was over that road trip. Now, of course, they did sign Chase Elliott to an extension for three years, which of course is begging a lot of questions in and of itself. He's old. He's going to be 38 by the time he finishes his contract. That means a 38 year old second baseman. How much really can you get out from him? But of course, we do know that Ruben Amaro is. This is where his money is going to be made. Is these next couple of days, uh, of course, this past week. As well, it's the decision making process not only for this season or whatever remains of this season, but also for next year and the year after that. The Phillies, the fans are sick and tired. I mean, I hear it all the time, they're sick and tired of not making the playoffs, they want to go back. And so, the only way that they'll be fine of not making the playoffs is if there's that decision to blow the whole thing up to just start from scratch. And unlike what the Boston Celtics did now, the Phillies are not about to do that because they feel like they can still contend. If not this year because of injuries, then next year certainly they can kind of go back to the drawing board to try to shore up some of the potential hazardous position. Uh, Ari, as always, uh, we know I know your time is, is, is of the essence and uh, you're a busy guy, so thank you very much for coming on, joining me here on Sports Up, the Sports Rabbi. And uh, until next time, voice of the Drexel Dragons. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on. Uh, no problem. I'll take care now. That was Ari Bluestein, voice of the Drexel Dragons basketball and also the CEO of SFB and the Philly High School Sports Network here joining me on Sports Talk at the Sports Rally 2. Uh, again, to, to, to get a little bit of really what's a feel for what's going on in the baseball world, to get a really, uh, you know, an idea as to what's going to happen when, in terms of both his hometown Phillies and uh, my Yankees and, of course, the Major League Baseball story, that being the Biogenesis Clank that are looming tomorrow. Of course, the rumors are the big names like Johnny Peralta and Nelson Cruz that they've all gone ahead and have, uh, uh, you know, really taken the plea bargain with baseball and have decided that they'll take 50 games and then they will sit that out and come back. The big fish, which of course remains to be seen what will happen is Alex Rodriguez, it seems like he's going to fight tooth and nail to make sure that he is able to stay and collect uh, while, you know, what's, what's remaining on his contract with the Yankees. Nearly a hundred million dollars plus incentives through 2017. You're listening to Sports Talk here on Almost Radio Powered by the Panic School Broadcasting. On the other side of this, your phone calls, your texts, your tweets. I'll be right back. It's been 48 years. Connecticut School Broadcasting has helped place thousands of people, just like you, in exciting careers in radio, television, and the new media. At Connecticut School Broadcasting, our hands-on approach is different. It's designed to have you spend less time in the classroom and more time in the studios. From the first day, you'll work with state-of-the-art equipment. Learn by doing from our team of industry professionals who come from their studios to ours. The best part about it, you'll learn it all. In a matter of months, not years, Connecticut School Broadcasting has a network of 12 campuses, from Massachusetts to Miami. Remember, it's never too late to love what you do. So do what I did. Call 1-800-TV Radio. Step into the fast-paced world of the broadcast media. Day and evening classes begin soon. Connecticut School Broadcasting. Get trained and get connected now. Call 1-800-TV Radio or log on to GoCSB.com. Your computer is blowing up, blowing up in the sound of all noise radio. Powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. Welcome back to Sports Talk on All Noise Radio, powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. And you know, when you you're talking about the off season, and we have a lot of different off seasons going on all at the same time. And you have the NFL offseason, you have the NBA offseason, but more importantly right now, we have the NHL offseason. And with me right now on the air, I bring in to via phone WFAN's NHL insider Dan Friedman. Dan, how are you? Good, how you doing? Very well, thanks. So we got we got a lot of things going on, having going on in the NHL, and most notably, of course, is the where will they end up in terms of the different free agents that are available still to be had by teams should they desire. You have, for example, Scott Gomez. I mean, he came back this past season with San Jose and still showed that he has some life in him. Where do you think he's going to end up? Uh, I mean, I really narrowed down those, those four teams where I think he'd be a nice fit. Uh, I'm looking at the teams Kyrie, New Jersey Devils, the Tender Lady, and the Doilers. I think all those teams really have one thing in common that's that they don't have a ton of depth of center. So to spot a guy like Scott Gomez into their third line, because I think that's his role nowadays. I don't think he's that, you know, he's not the star anymore, but he is a guy who plays solid in his own zone, makes some nice plays, you know, he'll, he'll do a little bit of everything. And he's a good depth complimentary piece to have. Great for those teams, and, you know, I think it's good help. I think it'll be treating one of those obviously doubles because he's kind of lost up there. And it would be, you know, ironic, if not very interesting, for Gomez to come back and wear that jersey again. So uh, I think those are the four teams you'll be able to find them. It's going to be a while. I think, you know, Scott Gomez is still very much of a wild card you know, as far as the GMs are concerned. So I think that's what's playing in here. And you know, if they can find it, I'm sure we'll get a shot for the right open team. Well, interestingly enough, the Devils also this offseason a couple weeks ago signed another we'll call him a, a young geezer in Yarnu Yager so it's very likely that it would be an interesting choice for the Devils to bring back Gomez but certainly one that the fan base would love especially after seeing Ilya Kovalchuk bounce for the KHL we have a bunch of there are a bunch of uh, uh, goaltenders who have their situations have really simply been unresolved and two of the names that you hear most often and in terms of where will they end up if they will end up anywhere are of course Tim Thomas who took a year off this past season and Ilya Brzgalov formerly of the Flyers formerly from Philadelphia really it's, it's a big question surrounding him if he can still be a top and netminder in the NHL well, yeah, uh, Tim Thomas and Brizal are definitely, I'd say, the two best goalies on the market. Um, you know, the interesting thing is, unfortunately for them, the, there isn't much of a market these days because there are very few teams, if anyone, really starting open there. Uh, most teams don't. Uh, there's one really that comes to mind, I guess, is the Calgary Flames, especially because Mika Kipchoge, depending on who you talk to, is either retiring or not retiring. He said he's retiring. The Flames say they're trying to block him out of it, and uh, he still looks at the Flames roster on their website, so it's kind of a iffy situation. But if, assuming he doesn't come back, the goalies there are Joey McDonald and Tyrano, and I have a hard time believing that the Flames are going to go into September with those two as their goalies. I think that they're going to have to pursue someone. And I don't see Tim Thomas, you know, moving to Calgary. So I think Joey Brizal is someone that they might very well consider either him or Ozzy perhaps. Uh, you know, as for other landing spots, I mean, I don't think that Tim Thomas is going to go back to Boston to be to the last understudy. I don't think that's something that he's willing to do at this point. Uh, you know, he's just under contract to the Islanders, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure that they've been in touch with two sides. I don't know
I think, well, it seemed with Rizgal, though, being snubbed out from the Russian hockey team for the, the Olympic team being left off, that he certainly has to shore up his game as, uh, between the pipes. So with regards to Tim Thomas, there's been rumors that he would end up in Florida as a 20-game or more backup. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I appreciate the segue that you gave me to the next portion of this. Steve Eiserman, general manager extraordinaire in Tampa, or at least so we thought after the first season, after his rookie year as a GM there with the Lightning, making it all the way to the Cup Finals. Now, they haven't really been that, shall we say, competitive in terms of postseason the last two years, and he made the decision to ship Le Cavalier, the former captain Vinny Le Cavalier, to the Philadelphia. What does this decision by Eiserman, what does it mean both for the Bolts, both for the Lightning, as well as the Flyers on the receiving end of Le Cavalier? Well, we didn't see him go out Le Cavalier and sign for Flyers. But, um, you know, look, I mean, he's, he had a huge contract. Um, you know, I'm not saying I would have bought him out, but I understand why they did. The Flyers, I mean, it's, it's another big contract for the guy who I think it is going to step up for them. But, again, it puts them in a lot of financial turmoil. I mean, they have a lot of money committed to the guys who are older. You know, it's, it's uh, Retaliate, Mark Stray, and, you know, so it's, it's a lot of money to commit to those guys. So I'm not sure exactly what's there because he is. But, uh, I mean, I've been, I've been shooting things for years. I really have been unimpressed with him as a, as a general manager. And for somebody who was, you know, in Detroit for so many years and saw, you know, the, the importance of building around the blue line and saw, you know, Nicholas Lidstrom as that rock of the blue line and stretch for many years. I think the Cavs on Seth Jones in the draft, I thought, was just, you know, unbelievable. I really didn't think he was going to do it. And for somebody who was, you know, in Detroit for so many years and saw, you know, the importance of building around the blue line and stretch for many years. I think the Cavs on Seth Jones in the draft, I thought, was just unbelievable. I really didn't think he was going to do it. And for somebody who was, you know, in Detroit for so many years and saw, you know, the importance of building around the blue line and stretch for many years. Certainly also after the whole uh, buying out of the Cavalier, then going ahead and spending all that money to bring in Vitaly Topula, uh, certainly also adds to the question marks for Steve Eisenman's decision making. Now, in terms of the NHLPA, in terms of the, its boss Donald Spear, there have been rumors swirling the last week or so that he may ditch town and go back to his old post with the Major League Baseball Players Association, take over his job that is currently being held by Michael Weiner, and of course, Donald's brother Steve will take over his position at the NHLPA. What, are, uh, what have you heard? Well, Donald Spear came out this weekend uh, to sell the rumors that he's definitely not going to do this thing at all. Um, you know, he loves being part of hockey. He sees this as a, as a growing product, and uh, he really spoke about that this weekend around about how he thinks it's, it's a growing product, and that he's uh, excited to take the next step, which many believe is a World Cup, which is going to be tough between the NHL and the Players Association and all that. Um, so I think that he's so intentional. I don't think he's going anywhere else. Uh, and, he looked, and he said that this week, so I don't think there's anything to that. Well, beyond just the World Cup, of which both the United States and Canada won the only two prior World Cups that have ever been played, U.S. in 96 and Canada in 2004 just before the lockout, there's also the rumors of the NHL moving to Seattle. I mean, there's a Seattle radio host named uh, uh, Mitch Levy who tweeted that there's a petition by Bettman, by Gary Bettman, the commissioner, to the NHL Board of Governors to consider to even out a little bit the disparity created now with the new realignment of there being two more teams in the East versus in the West. What are your thoughts and what have you heard about Seattle becoming a, a new NHL hotbed? Well, we know a few things. We know that the NHL is very much considering what they call what they've termed as the Pacific Northwest, which uh, I think is vague for a reason, and uh, you know, they came out, Bill Bailey's deputy commissioner came out and said that you know, we haven't necessarily been concerned specifically Seattle, but I think we have to include Portland, Oregon as well. Oregon as well, that's uh, definitely another city they're looking at. So, and I think with Seattle, you really have two questions. A, is there a local ownership group that's financially committed? And B, is there a arena they can play in? Um, neither of those questions are really answered right now. There is no arena right now. There is no ski arena, which is not really a viable facility. On the other hand, Portland has the Rose Garden, which is what the NHL considers to be a serious viable facility for NHL teams to play in. So, um, those are the two things they're really considering in the Pacific Northwest. The NHL is very much interested in the region. So, and I think that if they were to explore that in terms of expansion, I think that would happen very soon. Oh. But, uh, Seattle, Seattle has a chance, but they really need to, you know, they need to show that they have these means and that they have the infrastructure in place. Well, certainly with regards to Seattle, it, would, it, it may fall into a kind of, if you build it, they will come. Because Key Arena might just be like a band-aid for a year or two. But really, that's not, really, since the Seattle Supersonics moved to Oklahoma City and became a thunder down there in the NBA, nothing really has gone to Key Arena and stayed for more than just a show or two. In terms of Portland, the question, though, that I find is, can two, uh, you know, really good hockey franchises exist in the same town, exist in the same city? Right now, Portland has the Winterhawks, and if they have an NHL team, that would be very questionable from the NHL's perspective, I think, to have another team draw away from what the AHL product has in Portland already. But... Uh, as I do know that uh, we're all going to keep our eyes and ears peeled on this uh, developing situation as it, uh, as it unfolds over the next coming weeks, possibly the next coming months. Uh, Dan, as always, I appreciate the time you taking out of your day to come join me here on Sports Talk with Sports Rabbi. Uh, always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you very much. Always a pleasure. All right, take care now. That was Dan Friedman from New York, the WFAN hockey columnist, Islanders insider, and all-around good guy joining me here. When we come back from the break, we'll be taking some of your phone calls. You're listening to Sports Talk on the Sports Talk on all-news radio powered by the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. 
You know, our jobs occupy more than half our waking hours. Shouldn't we be doing something we love? Call Connecticut School of Broadcasting at 1-800-TV Radio or log on to gocsb.com. Since 1964, Connecticut School of Broadcasting, with a network of 12 campuses from Massachusetts to Miami, has helped place thousands of grads as DJs, sportscasters, entertainment reporters, behind the scenes in audio and video production, every aspect of the broadcast media. Connecticut School of Broadcasting has trained men and women of all ages and backgrounds in a matter of months, not years. Learn by doing from area radio and TV pros. Call 1-800-TV Radio or log on to gocsb.com. Remember, it's never too late to love what you do. Day and evening classes begin soon. Get trained. Get connected now.
school of broadcasting. From modern rock to old school hip-hop. Go through the classical, news, talk, sports, and more. It's the noise you can't ignore. Log on to allnoiseradio.com. Fire up the station, find out more about your favorite jocks. Get the latest CSB news and more. Plus, you can take allnoiseradio with you on the go for free. Just download the Live 365 app to your iPhone.